welcome to 242. And that's 242. I am your host, Keith Andrew. Along here is a good friend of Nathan mine, Nathan Osmond. I just want to say thank you for being a guest on my talk show. Thank you, Keith Andrew. It's good to be here, bud. Now, for people who want to know what Uncensored is, Uncensored is my way of showing people that even with a learning disability, I can still overcome controversy and reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm able to... Let me repeat that. <laughs> you think after 200, I would get it nailed down, right? The whole point of my talk show is to show people that even with a learning disability, I can still overcome controversy, reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm able to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there dealing with any type of disabilities or warning disabilities. But you should never give up or have people label you. And you should prove to them you can stem out to something and overcome labels. So that being said, just half hour, 45 minutes every time. You can say anything you want to curse if you want to. This is your time and I'm going to put you in the driver's seat in a little bit and then put you in charge. You can ask me anything you want. No hold bar. You can take the gloves off. And uh, starting off, what can you tell us about yourself? About myself? Well, uh, I'm a country singer. That's something I do. Um, as far as who I am, I'm a child of God. You know, I think we all are. I know we all are. And that makes you my brother. And I think if everybody viewed each other in the true perspective of who we truly are, we're all brothers and sisters, I think there'd be a lot less chaos in this world, a lot less shootings, you know, a lot less war. Um, I just heard about that police officer in just north of Chicago that got shot and just died. You know, I just, I hate to hear stories like that. Because I think that, uh, you know, we ask you, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, I can tell you what I do. And I think oftentimes we look at each other and give each other value based on our job titles. Right. Or what we do for a living. You know, versus like, what are you creating with your life? What are you doing to make a difference? I mean, look what you're doing, Keith. It's incredible. You know, you, you say you have a disability. You're not disabled. You take off that disc, you're able. Look at what you're doing. You know, my father, Alan, he's had uh, tw he's had multiple sclerosis for 28 years. He was the lead, you know, leader of the Osmonds. They sold over 100 million records. He was a black belt trained by Chuck Norris. I mean, the guy could do anything. He produced, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records, not only for producing the, the most watched variety TV show, but also for the most firecrackers lit off at one time, you know? It's pretty incredible, a million fifty thousand firecrackers in six seconds. He, that's my dad, you know? But is that is that who he is or is that what he does? You know, the, my father is, he's, I don't look at him as, a, as an entertainer or a singer, he's my dad. And then we all wear different hats in life, right? Um, I, 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 I'm just really in awe of what he's been able to do with his disability. He went on Larry King's show one time, he talked about his multiple sclerosis. He says, Larry, it's not the disease that gets you. It's not your condition. It's the lack of hope. So you can't have faith until you have hope first. And so my father keeps hope alive. He says, I might have MS, but MS does not have me. And that's been his slogan from day one. So my hat's off to you, bro, for all that you're doing to make a difference in this world. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Now, the next question I was going to ask you, did your father... Influ well, apparently he, uh, he was a singer. Did your father influence you to become a singer yourself? He did whether he wanted to or not. You know, I don't think he wanted to be a stage parent, but that's exactly what he's been. He's been there through every stage of my life. Um, he, as an entertainer, influenced me, uh, introduced me to this business because I was surrounded by it. Uh, the, you, know, you probably remember Donnie and Marie. They're my uncle and aunt. And so I grew up on the set of their television show and watched them perform with my father and uncles and it just seemed like so much fun i used to tour on the tour buses with them and that's kind of where i caught the bug as they call it for this entertainment business but you know he he encouraged us to get our education he says keep it a hobby and and that wasn't good enough for me as far as that advice because to me i thought well father you did it you know why would you want me to just go halfway with something or treat it as a hobby when this is what i want to do the key in life, I think, is knowing what you want in life and what you want to do with your life. Yeah, the, most of the people haven't figured that out nowadays, and they're still twiddling their thumbs at 40 or 50 going, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, and, and, and that's why they settle for working for someone else rather than going after what they really want. I think that, uh, you know, I figured it out a long time ago that this is what I want, and I'm grateful that I have the support of my wife and my children 
to be able to go and do this because yeah just like any business it's it's scary sometimes being out there on your own trying to make it and, and, and the thing is is you're not in business uh, by yourself you're in business for yourself so I've learned that one of the keys to success in anything is having a good team having people around you that know what to do people you can trust people you can um, get a good good sound advice from my uncle Donnie who's uh, you probably know him he's been on a lot of different movies and shows and game show hosts and Donnie Osmond right Donnie Osmond yep he said uh, he said Nate beware of yes men I said what's that oh you're the best you're the greatest oh you can do nothing wrong do you want that kind of person giving you advice when all they do is just blow smoke in your face he says you don't want to be around negative people but be around someone that's going to say you know what it was a little flat there you know you, you, let's, let's work on that let's fix that you know here's what we can improve here's what we're doing right but here's how we can make it better you know, so don't be around. Beware of yes men, he says. So, and he also told me you got to have thick skin in this business, of all businesses, because it is brutal, and they can eat you alive. And and not everybody's going to like you, and you have to be okay with that, which is the hardest thing for an entertainer, because our goal when we step on that stage is to make everybody like us, right? Right. We want everybody to go home happy, super, just in love with what we we sang, everything we did. We just want everybody to be happy. You can go crazy trying to please everybody. At the end of the day, you have to know that you left it all out there on the stage, that you put your heart and soul into that, and you have to know that not everybody is going to like it, and you have to be okay with that because you can go crazy trying to please everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I do have a couple of funny stories for you, but I'm going to ask you, did you, um, you mentioned slogans. Did your father ever give you any I'm just trying, I was to say catchphrases about more uh, quotes to live by. Oh, he's giving me all sorts, and especially good ones that tie in with disabilities. You know, tough times never last, but tough people do. He always had this poem in his bathroom called The Man Who Thinks He Can. Of course, because it was in the bathroom, he changed the word to The Man Who Thinks On The Can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> had fun with that. But one thing that's always been a slogan or, you know, something for our family is the word tough. He has a big rock outside of his house that says, life is tough. Now, he's not a very good speller because he spells it T-U-F-F. -F. And this is the secret to our success. He says, T, target. What is your target? Do you know what you want in life? We just talked about that. What is your goal? What is your target? See, this last, this last month here, my goal was to do 5,000 push-ups. I can't do that all in one day. I, I really have no arms left. So what do I do? I do 160 a day. Okay, there's 31 days in, in that month, and so guess what? I did I did 60 a day, 160 a day, and then I did an additional 40 to make up the whole 5,000. So now I'm in, yeah, I'm starting a new month today, and I'm I'm ready to rock this thing out and do it again. Now I got to step it up about six extra a day because the, the month's shorter. But at least see, I had a target and I hit it because I knew what I wanted to do. So in life, you got to set your target. Well, you want to be successful in your television show here. You want to be successful in a music career, as a businessman, as a father or mother. You know, what do you want to do with your life? Have that target and then understand. That's the you part. Understand what it's going to take to hit that target. You see, uh, I like the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. It says, if you don't know where you want to go, it doesn't matter which road you take, right? If you don't have a target, you got to understand that there's going to be some bumps along the road. You have to understand it's going to take some blood, sweat, tears, uh, sleepless nights. You know, people that really go after their goals. They don't require a lot of sleep because they're so excited about it. They don't. They just get up in the morning and keep going, right? Because they have a focus. So if a target, understand that that's the next word is focus. Because you, there's going to be a lot of distractions in life. People say, hey, come do this. Or, oh, hey, this works over here. Or, Why are you doing that? Come over this way, right? We're, we're constantly being fed advertisements. And, hey, this is what's going to make you cool. And here's what you need to be doing with your time. And what is your target? Are you understanding what it takes, and are you focusing? And last but not least is the other F, and that's fight. you got to have umph in triumph, right, if you're going to win. You've got to really have the eye of the tiger, and you just got to stay laser-focused. So going back to that, that first F of focus, you know, I've worked with Tony Robbins and a lot of big motivational speakers. One thing that Tony teaches is that if you're ever uh, in, in racing, he says, if you're ever in a tailspin, don't ever look at the wall. Because guess what you're going to hit? The wall. He says, if you will, they've proven this. He said, if you will put your focus down towards where you want the car to go, the, the body will naturally pull the car out of the tailspin and you'll start going where you want to go. See, our problems are those little things that we notice and, and see 
when we take our eyes off our target or our goal. So you got to have that focus in that fight too. So that's that's how you get tough. Yeah, absolutely. There's two quotes I like, and one of them has the word "gg" in it. I know I don't want to offend you by saying "goddamn," but I would say it only if it was. Me. <laughs> if you're okay with that, I like to say it, but I don't want to offend you. Oh, go ahead. Say, say gosh dang instead. See, that's, that's Utah slang right there for you. <laughs> well, the, well, that's called G Day. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, the quote is from uh, Did you ever see Suits? No, I didn't see it. A uh, Harvey Specter says, What do you do when you're backed up against the wall? You break the GD down. There you go. And the other one is he does the hand motion. People can't see me, but you can do it, so they know what I'm talking about. It's like yeah. you're here. I like to be here. Yeah. Not down here, but yeah. up here. Sure. Well, that's uh, that's the true thing. I mean, you, some people, I want to go over it, round it, under it, then they plow right through it sometimes. But in order to do that, you have to have what's called momentum. You have to get, you got to get going, right? Right. You got to have some traction. Uh, otherwise, you go over around it, but you, either way, you, you get you get past the obstacle. Because you can make excuses, or you can make money, or you can make whatever it is you want to make, but you can't make both. That's true. Now, the next question I was going to ask you, and I got to pass the show over to you, was when you became famous, what when people like to know, tell us a little about yourself before you became famous, and that's the first question. And now that you are famous, do you feel a responsibility to give back? And do you think all famous people should give back? You know, fame is, is a weird four-letter F word, you know? And it, it can be a good thing, it can be a not-so-good thing, depending on who you talk to. And, and, you know, somebody once said this funny quote, they said, you know, do you know who I think I am? <laughs> You know, because a lot of these famous people tend to say, hey, I'm the greatest, I'm this and that. And, and if they have to say it, then maybe they should really think about what they just said. Because if you have to say it, you have to say, yeah, you're famous, I'm famous. You, you know, you got some issues. Um, my children know my name, you know, and that's, that's good enough. My wife, she knows my name. And my friends do as well. And that's the key is that success or fame, as a lot of people kind of tie fame to success, that's their definition, apparently, of what success is. Because I know a lot of famous people that are so miserable, that are so messed up. I mean, you just watched the VMAs the other night. This world is screwed up. You know, this whole industry, it's all about shock and awe. Where'd the music go? It wasn't even about music the other night. And I, I'm, I'm gutsy enough to talk about it. We sit here and applaud all this, whatever that was. You know, I was I was interested in the music. You know, it's all gimmicks that people are trying to use nowadays. Why don't we let the music speak for itself? See, we got to get back to the basics. Uh, we, we've gotten so often to Gaga Land and Miley Cyrus that it's all costume. It's not Halloween. We're here to celebrate music and great art and visual. And, and that's all they did was try and shock and awe and not wear any clothes. Well, I'm more interested about music, so to each their own, but you know what? I fear for the future of this industry because of what I saw the other night, and I fear for the youth of the world because uh, as far as it goes with role models, you know, you gotta you got to watch out there. Uh, who do you consider a role model? I mean, let me ask you a question. You're interviewing me, but let me ask you a question. Who are some of your role models? Well, like I said, I'm gonna, this is a perfect opportunity to put you in the driver's seat, and you can ask me any, anything you want. As your first question, I would say my dad. Yeah. Uh, I say my brother. He thinks I'm an ass kisser, but <laughs> yeah, he I do use him for an inspiration. I copy, try to copy, and mirror what he does, and I try to do it for myself. Yeah. Uh, one of my heroes, Brett the Hitman Hart. Um, there are sober people I will I like, you know, like Hulk Hogan, Chris Stratus, Melina Perez. But the ones that, if I have to say heroes, it's my dad, my brother, and Brett to Hitman Hart. There you go. And what makes them heroes to you? Well, uh, one, I say the first two because, you know, it's family. 
and I always try to live up to their expectations or go up and beyond that. And as far as Bret Hart, he um tell you a funny story of why I think I consider Bret Hart one of my heroes idols. I got the chance to meet him. Yeah. And uh back in ninety five. And um well there's actually two stories, but the first one is I got a chance to meet him in ninety five. I was on a Saturday or Sunday, don't remember. And we went to the mall. It was, he was supposed to be there for 10 to 2. So we went there about 12. We were on the line. My parents went to shopping and whatever. Came back and went, Jesus, you guys are still here? Did he even move? Did his line even move? Yeah. Oh, a little bit. Oh, well, we give you an extra hour. If it doesn't move, we're going home. Oh, they waited all this time. We need to be more patient. And my dad sees it on Bret Hart. And I said this to Bret Hart. That brings up my second story in a couple minutes. And I said, you believe this guy? His head's down. He's signing pass, sign pass, sign pass. Not taking pictures, not in the knowledge. And I have no idea before that if he was. I don't know if he was just tired. So I'm not going to say anything about that. Because I really don't know. But when I was there, his head was down. He had sign pass, sign pass. And I made up my mind. I'm going to get his attention. No matter what I have to do, he's going to look at me. Uh, My uh, brother, who I... I'm the youngest out of four brothers and one sister. So one of my brothers, who I mentioned you, I woke up to. He went up first. And nothing, no response. Then my other brother, who's before me, I'm the youngest, went up, no response. And I thought it was him, my brother, who got the... um, took my autograph and as it was being pulled forward I noticed it wasn't him it was Brett and I got a death grip on it because I didn't know it was Brett I thought it was him and my brother and as I saw I was Brett was pulling it he stopped and I, I swear do you know who I thought he was saying this guy saying to me hey kid do you want me to sign this or what instead he stopped what he was doing he walked right at me and he smiled that one act of kindness left an imprint on my life. And ever since then, I was a big fan of his. Yeah. Oh, see? And aren't you glad he, he, he didn't get upset about that? Because I, my grandmother was a big fan of, uh, I won't say which actor off of uh, MASH. You know, but when she finally had a chance to meet him, he must, must have had a bad day or something. Because he was not a nice person. And she lost, he lost a fan for the rest of her life. You know, and so that's the thing is that to the world you might just be one person, but to one person you might be the world. And the fact that uh, you treat, treat he treated you kindly like that really helped you to be even more of a fan. And we, we found that you've got to take good care of your fans. Uh, one thing that uh, that we learned uh, from Elvis Presley, he was a good friend of my father and uncle's. He watched them one time at Caesar's Palace because they didn't have time to come out and sign a lot of autographs in between shows. My grandfather had the idea is, what if we let the fans come backstage in a big line? You guys stay here in the dressing room. You know, you can shake hands, say, take pictures, eat pizza, whatever. Get ready for the second show, but sign some autographs, and we can, and we can cover that. Yeah, Elvis noticed that. He says, you guys are doing it right. He said, if I could go back and do it all over again, I'd go out and I'd sign every autograph. I'd shake every hand. I'm sure there's times you couldn't do it because of security reasons, but, but the thing is, is that we've always tried to take good care of our fans, and they've always taken great care of us. So we, have, we, we, we claim to have the best fans in the whole world. In fact, the Osmond family received a star on the Walk of Fame back in 2003. And did you know that it is one of two, of all those stars, only two stars were purchased by the fans of the artist. All those other stars were purchased as a PR stunt, as a, for a producer or a studio, or something to keep the name of their artist out there. They're about 16 grand a piece, those stars. So the fact that the fans of the Osmond family got together and raised over 16 grand, on top of that, they paid for hotels and ballrooms to, to throw celebrations to honor our family. It's unbelievable. The very first star was Liza Minnelli's, and then the second one was the Osmond family. So that really speaks volumes to the love that the fans have shown to our family. And we always try to reciprocate that and, and be there for them. So it's a win-win for sure. Well, I do have a couple more questions to you before we wrap up. Uh, I want to pass the show over to you. Is there anything else you want to ask me? 
Yeah, to, tell me about this disability that you say you have because I'm in awe of what you're doing with your career, man. You got great things. It's okay. <laughs> we like to sing about uh, fresh air and fields of grain and family and stuff. So tell me about you. Tell me why. Tell me why you say you have a disability. I was labeled back in high school, and this followed me up to this point. I was never able to go to college. Stay put me down I guess it's a compliment in a way but I guess yeah being called retarded is not really a compliment but it's my way of saying hey look you make say I'm retarded mentally disturbed I uh, read, read at a fifth grade level I, I can't drive I can't do this I can't do that but the reason I'm so good at making videos since your question is I've been doing this since I was 15. I'm 27 now. Wow. Actually, 26. Actually, no. Actually, I don't remember how old I am. I, <laughs> I know that's, uh, that's uh, I think 27. I think years or more you've been doing it. <laughs> 27. But, uh. 12 years. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I've been doing it a day and I started off with just steel pictures and I uh, watched my dad and. Well, so he made sneeze to make um, high school yearbooks, video yearbooks. Yeah. And then I joined Audio Visual, and I met this guy, and he helped me with the whole video. And since then, it it just clicked. It's like, hey, I can't go to college, and I can't do what you're doing, but or I can, but it's going to be scaled back. And it's like, well, I'm gonna overcome labels. I used to say in the beginning. Um, I got a lot of heat for this, so a lot of people say, I used to say, I'm turning myself into a perfect example for people out there, deaf, blind, or in a wheelchair. Yeah. My family made fun of me for that, so like, first you're not blind, you're not deaf, and you're sore as hell not in a wheelchair, so how are you a perfect example for that? But the point is, I used to never have people label you. If you're passionate enough, do something you love, like what you're doing, what I'm doing. Yeah. If you're blind, you want to learn how to dance. If you're in the piano, yeah, piano. If you're in a wheelchair and you want to learn how to play the piano, go for it. If you're in a wheelchair, you still want to be an actor. You should prove to people, hey, it's just a label. Doesn't mean anything. I have the heart. I have the passion to do it. You're doing it. And that's really about it. But for my disability, I have ADD. ADD, HD, I'm blind without my glasses. Yeah. Uh, I, I can still see, but it's like, I can't see long distances. Yeah. Um, it's just basically just, I'm <laughs> trying to throw it back in people's faces. Like, hey, you labeled this on me for 27 years. Now, look what I'm able to do. And don't you feel like a fool for saying, you yeah. never got in the mouth of something. Keith, you weren't, you're not disabled, you're dislabeled, is all. And that's that's what people made a mistake in calling you retarded. Because just like you, my dear friend Les Brown, who's one of the best motivational speakers on the planet, he was labeled uh, mentally uh, retarded when he was in fourth grade. And, uh, and educable mentally retarded is what the kids call him. In fact, he had a twin brother and they called him DT, the dumb twin. I mean, when you grow up, and you, you hear this is what you're hearing from people. Thank heavens he was adopted. So he was born on the floor of a abandoned building in, in Liberty City, which is a suburb of Miami. And this wonderful lady, Mrs. Mamie Brown, adopted him. And she says, someone's opinion of you doesn't have to become your reality. In fact, his own instructor told him that because he called him up to the front of the room to do a math problem. He says, I can't do this because I'm educable, mental retarded. That's what people were telling him. But you know what? He's come a, a long ways. In fact, he and I did a CD together, and he became one of the most powerful, most sought-after motivational speakers on the planet. Isn't that amazing? He never graduated college because he learned that someone's opinion of him didn't have to become his reality, just like you're doing. You're not disabled. You're dislabeled, and it's their loss. You know, uh, we live in a very cruel world where bullying goes on, especially in the cyber world with, with Facebook and Twitter and all these other sites. Where people can hide behind uh, usernames, and that's all they're doing is using people and abusing people out there, and they think they can get away with it. You know what? I believe what goes around comes from kind of this world and the next. So, like I said, you know, you, I asked you who your heroes were, who, who were your role models, and you said your dad and your brothers. Well, that's incredible. They may not be on television, but isn't that amazing that 
that we, we consider heroes just the people that are on TV because of fame? Seriously, uh, one person can really make a difference in the lives of millions of people, and they don't even have to be famous. Uh, I, I believe uh, my, my buddy Andrew, Andy Andrews, he, he shared something about the butterfly effect. And um, it, it's not the... Uh, not that little movie, the, the terrible movie, The Butterfly Effect, you know. But I'm talking about this doctoral thesis that was created by Edward Lorenz back in the 60s, 1963 to be exact. And guess what? It, it was a doctoral thesis claiming that little butterflies on the other side of the world can flap their little wings and they can move air mo molecules, which can then in turn move more air molecules and so on and so forth. Until it can literally become a major storm or even like a hurricane on the other side of the world. Little butterflies. They thought it was ridiculous, right? But it was interesting, so it's, it hung around for a long time. Well, uh, Andy tells the story better, better than anybody. But the thing is, is that the long story short is that after many years of research and, and studying and looking into this interesting doctoral thesis, they found that the butterfly effect was not only li you know viable, but it worked every single time with every type of moving matter, including humans. So you stop and think about it, you know, how can one person really affect the lives of that many people? Well, Andy Andrews, you got to check out his book, the, the Traveler's Gift. He's incredible. He says one night he was ironing a shirt in his room, and the television was on in the other room, and, and they were doing the whole person of the week. Uh, you know, the person of the week uh, for this week, was Peter Jennings was doing it. He said, person of the week is Norman Borlaug. And he puts down his iron. He runs in the next room. He didn't even know this guy was still alive. Norman Borlaug. This guy had received the you know the Nobel Peace Prize or something for the he had hybridized a type of corn and wheat uh, that had literally saved the lives of over two billion people in county. And they they could plant it in the arid arid you know countries of uh, of South Africa and, and Saudi Arabia and other places that literally fed billions of people, saved lives over two billion people in county. So he's getting the Person of the Week award. But it kind of irritated him because he knew that it wasn't Norman Borlaug that had saved the lives of those two billion people in county. It was the Vice President of the United States, Henry Wallace, under Roosevelt. Some people say, wait, wait, wasn't, wasn't Truman the Vice President? Yes, later on, but the very first Vice President that, uh, that, that Roosevelt had was a guy named uh, Henry Wallace. And while he had the power of that position as his Vice President, Henry Wallace created a post in Mexico for the sole purpose of learning how to hybridize corn and wheat, and he hired a young Norman Borlaug to run that post. So if you really stop and think about it, it was really the vice president of the United States that had made that move to learn how to do this in the first place to save the lives of two billion people and counting. Unless maybe it was George Washington Carver. We love history, right? We love it. Carver created so many great things out of the peanuts and the, the sweet potatoes. And what else he did? He fed half of the United States during uh, World War II with the Victory Garden. The guy was incredible, but little known fact that when he was a dairy, he had a dairy science professor at Iowa State University who uh, on Sundays would uh, allow his little six-year-old son to go with George Washington Carver on these botanical expeditions. And while nobody's looking, you know, he's flapping his wings on butterfly, or butterfly wings on peanuts and sweet potatoes. When no one's looking, he's flapping his wings into the heart of a little six-year-old Henry Wallace, teaching him what plants can do and how they can help save the lives of two billion people and counting, right? So if you really stop and think of it, I'm thinking that perhaps George Washington Carver should have deserved the person of the week that week. Unless, maybe it was the farmer from Diamond, Missouri. You see, uh, uh, Moses and Susan uh, lived in a, they lived in this little state uh, where, where they... They didn't believe in slavery, but this, the state did, and that caused a lot of problems for these radicals like Quantrill's Raiders that would just come in there and they'd burn horse, or, or barns and run off of horses and kill people, and it was just terrible. Well, one day, um, Mary Washington was standing there. She was Susan's best friend, and these, these crazies come into town, and they, they, they take this lady and ride off with her because she refused to let go of her little infant baby boy, and this just really caused the... Uh, you know, Susan and Moses, uh, a lot of distress because Mary was their best friend. And so rather than just, you know, weep about it, they decided, let's go try and get her back. How can we do this? Let's put a little question over here, a poster over here. And after a few days, guess what? Moses was able to line up uh, a, a meeting with an offshoot group of Quantrill's Raiders to get get that get them back. Well, 
he rode hours and hours up to this little crossroad in Kansas, a little cold January night. And here they come riding up with the little burlap sacks on their faces and the holes cut out for the eyes. And Moses traded his only horse for what they threw to him in this bag. And they rode off in the night. And he opened up this bag and pulls out this frozen, almost dead baby boy. And he stuffed him in next to his skin in his shirt. And he walked that baby out talking to him, uh, knowing that his mother, Mary, had been killed. And uh, he promised then and there that he would raise this child as his own. And this is how Moses and Susan Carver came to raise this boy, George Washington. And so if you stop and think about it, one little farmer from Diamond, Missouri, made one little move in one frozen January night to save the life of that little boy, who then went on to save the lives of over 2 billion people in county. So really, wasn't it that little farmer that saved the lives of over 2 billion people in county? Unless, and you see, uh, we can do this all day, Keith. Who knows exactly who it was that made that one move that one night? It doesn't have to be anyone famous. It was a little farmer. that saved the lives of over 2 billion people in county. And I believe that you and I have the ability to, to affect it, just as many lives, if not more, by what we do today, tomorrow, and the next day, because everything that we do matters to all of us, not just one of us, all of us. What you're doing here today hopefully will inspire someone to go and live their dream. Somebody to get off of that couch or get out of that wheelchair and go do something. Quit making excuses. There's a kid named Kyle Maynard who's got a great book called No Excuses. Uh, the guy was born with no arms and no legs, and yet he's a wrestling and football champion. Excuse me? You know, I got a good friend who was, uh, he went blind at 23. He wrote a book called I'm Blind, So What? Isn't that a great attitude? Isn't it amazing what we can do when we don't listen to the labels or listen to the naysayers? But we just say, hey, I'm going to go do this with my life. See you later. Isn't that awesome? See, there's a lot of people that talk about what they want to do in life, and then there's the people that are like you that are out doing it. And those are the people I have most respect for. So congratulations, Keith, on being the doer. I love that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Now, wrapping up, I have two hard-hitting questions for you, if you don't mind. Do it. Bring it on. And the first one is gun control. And yeah. the second one is do you believe in a life after death? Which one do you want to talk about first? Either one, you pick it. All right, let's talk about gun tr gun control. When you mentioned the shooting, and also I don't know if that shooting happened. Did it happen today? I just read about it in the news. Yeah. Yesterday there was a shooting in Connecticut that happened. Yeah. You know what? I'm a big believer in the Second Amendment. It is our God-given right to be able to defend our families, and I, I believe that there there are rules in place that need to be, you know, enforced. Uh, do we need to take guns away? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I'm, I'm an advocate for guns. I have 100% on my hunter safety course. Guns don't kill people. Stupid people with guns kill people. Right. If you think we should have gun control it's because there's too many guns out there, that's like going and getting castrated because you think the next door neighbor has too many kids. <laughs> you know, you, I'd rather have a gun and not need it than to need a gun and not have it. So that's my stance on it. No, I agree with you. I, uh, I am for the Second Amendment, and I said this in my first episode. I'm going to say it on my 242nd episode. People who are mentally challenged or retarded, whatever you want to say it, but mentally challenged sounds better. <laughs> but people who are mentally challenged, mentally disturbed, are the R word. Um, people who are convicts, criminals, rapists, murderers. If those people are mentally screwed up, they should be on a list from being banned from getting firearms. Don't give me that BS about, oh, it's my Second Amendment. Yes, I am for the Second Amendment. You it have takes uh, responsibility because uh, if you do own a firearm, are you responsible enough to keep it in a place where those people can't get to it? You know, uh, you have to take responsibility. And the biggest problem in today's society, it seems, is that nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. Right. You know, the biggest argument we hear on Fox News or CNN, doesn't matter which channel you're watching, is if these people would just do this, then we wouldn't have these problems. And on the other side, hey, it's not our fault. If these people over here would just, just own up to it. I love what President Truman said. The buck stops here. If we would start in our own homes in our own counties and districts, and, and, and it all starts in the home, taking responsibility. If you're going to have a firearm, make sure you practice gun safety. 
right? Like I said, guns don't kill people. People that don't know what they're doing with guns or bad people with guns. Yeah, they, 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 they're the ones that are causing the problems out there. And we don't ever hear about the positive stories of the people that have the guns that stop the crime from happening. Where are those stories? See, the, the news will spin it any way they want to, and you can choose to listen to what they want to tell you, or you can go dig up and, and do your own research and find out that there's a lot of great positive stories out there of people that were able to stop the crime from happening because they could fight back. Right. And that's why our forefathers gave us that Second Amendment, so that we could defend ourselves, even from government, if it came to that. Hey, so what? Awesome. I have two more questions on that, if you don't mind. And I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. No worries. The first one is, do you support the right to kill in self-defense and only in self-defense? And then the second part is, when you say firearm, you just mean like a little tiny gun. You're not talking about any automatics. No, I'm talking about guns that are legal. And I, I, don't, like, I don't like a big government. I, I think that our government's gotten way too involved in too many things. I think that we need to, uh, to, to be wise with what, what we have. You know, is there any need to have sawed-off shotguns or, or Uzis or those? I don't think so. You know, I love to I love to go hunting. I have I don't go a whole lot, but on occasion I've gone. You know, I took my hunter safety course. There's a reason and a place for hunting. It helps to keep disease down. It helps to keep our, our earth, you know, healthy, and our and the people that live on this earth healthy. We don't just go to kill for fun. We we actually make jerky out of what we. My, my cousins are big big hunters, elk hunters, and you name it. And all of the meat that they, they make, they actually eat. They give it to hungry people. So it goes to a good use. Just to go out to kill an animal, to kill an animal, I don't think that's right. You know, so I think that if you if you, if you go out there to, to and you utilize what it is that you take, you know, I love that picture of the Native American with his hands up, giving thanks, you know, to the Great Spirit for, for what he's given. You know, every time that they had to eat, they thank the Great Spirit, right? I call him God. And you're speaking about, do I believe in life after death? Absolutely. 100%. I know that there's life after death. I know that my, my grandmother who just passed away this month or this last month, I know that I'll see her again. And, uh, you know, that angel came that night. I'm a Christian. I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I belong to him. But uh, the thing is, is that he said to them, uh, those shepherds, I bring you glad tidings of great joy that should be unto all men, right? And, and, and without Jesus Christ, I don't think there are glad tidings of great joy. I believe that he will come back again. Uh, I believe what the Bible says about it, and uh, definitely, there's too many things, you know, that that I've felt and and experienced to to know that there is there is life after death. I believe our loved ones are nearby. I believe they watch over us. You know, my uh, my little niece one night was coming up the stairs at my at my parents' house, and she was in the kitchen area, and she started waving up to the up to the ceiling area, and her mom asked her, "What are you doing?" She said, "I'm just saying hi to Grandma." And uh, she goes, oh, didn't think much about it until she got a phone call later that night saying that her grandmother had passed that night. You know, uh, children, I believe, are able to be, they're a little closer to the veil. And, right. You know, they, they were there not too long ago. Uh, everything was created spiritually before it was created physically. Just like the Bible talks about, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Where were we before we came to this earth? I believe we were with our Heavenly Father. There was a great plan. Read the Bible. I believe it. And um, the thing is, is that I think that our, our world today, you know, they try to put scripture over here or put it on the shelf or mock it because they want to justify their actions. See, the Lord, uh, I love it in the Ten Commandments, he talks about that there is no freedom without the law. Just like you're talking about gun control, this thing. You know, we just practice the laws that we have. If we get back to the Constitution, we are free. We're the freest nation on earth, the land of opportunities. But, just like I was teaching my children about commandments, I said the commandments are much like this stop sign right here. Because what if I didn't have that stop sign? What if God didn't tell me, don't do this, and I can fly through that intersection? I could be totally, completely wiped out, right? And that's a sad story right there. So we have God's laws, we have man's laws, right? We have laws to keep us safe, to keep us protected, to keep us free. Uh, there's a father that was flying a kite one time, and his son said, Hey, well, if I let go of this kite, will it just keep going? He says, Well, let's see what happens. He let go of the kite, and it started to fall. Right? He says, Son, the commandments are very much like this kite. Sometimes we feel like the things that are holding us down are really the things that are keeping us up. And I think that's really a cool teaching moment right there. And so, I, I, to answer your question about life after death, definitely. 
uh, I'm so excited to know that uh, my, my grandmother is uh, with my grandfather who passed away five years and two days before her. She went five years and two days, you know, not being able to see him. But think about the reunion that's going on. I have to not be selfish and be excited for my grandmother and the reunions that are going on. I talked to a man the other day that doesn't believe that there's a God, and it's really heartbreaking. You know, I said, I don't know how people that believe that can go through what I just went through with this funeral. You know, when you have to say goodbye to a loved one because... It's never goodbye. It's always, we'll see you later. I believe the families could be together forever. Um, I love sharing my faith. Uh, if people want to know more about it, mormon.com or lds.org. Go talk to a missionary. If you're having doubts about whether God lives, go check it out. Ask the question. But it all comes down to knowing whether or not there's a God or not. I happen to know there is. And I know that he loves all of us. As I started this interview off, I'm a child of his. And so are you. We're all God's kids. And I know he loves every one of us. The way we do it to one of the least of these, we do it unto him. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to have this conversation together. So hopefully, you know, Keith, you and I can touch someone's heart out there and be that perfect example of what the power of one can be in this world and the difference that we can make if we just choose to stand up and be a voice instead of an echo. Yeah, absolutely. Now, wrapping up, do you, uh, how can fans follow you on Twitter, Facebook, are you on social media? I'm on every one of those social media sites. You just look up Nathan Osmond or Nathan Osmond Music, and you're going to find me. Uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram is at Nathan Osmond. My Facebook page, like page, is Nathan Osmond Music. Um, I'm on YouTube under Nathan Osmond Music. And, of course, if you want any of those links, you just go to my website, which is NathanOsmond.com.